lament, love, and live. We read in the Psalms, great greatness and grandeur are in front of God. Strength and beauty are in God's sanctuary. Hmm, is that so? I was walking my dog McKenna this morning and along the curbs and throughout the King Drive Midway, it pretty much looks like a landfill. Grandeur and beauty are not the first words that come to my mind. And I thank God for my neighbor who has one of those long reacher things. And he is out there day in and day out, summer, winter, spring, fall, cleaning our block and cleaning the midway. Day in and day out, he practices what I think is a seemingly futile exercise. Now, before you sigh and assume this is another Earth Day sermon that's going to beat us up about using too much plastic and too long of showers and wasting food and not demonstrating the policies and pipelines being built across the sacred lands of Native people and on and on and on, that's not this. Rather than castigating one another for our lack of care for God's creation, Perhaps lamenting might be more appropriate. Lament, while very evident in the biblical witness, is not a term or practice that, that we're very familiar with in the 21st century. Unlike our ancient mothers and fathers of faith, when someone dies, we don't put ashes on our forehead. We don't rip our clothes and beat our chest. We do not wail in the streets. Through the centuries, our individualism has such deep clutches in our cultural psyche that we have so privatized our grief that it's no longer common even to wear black for some point of time after a loved one has died. No longer are there really outward signs of our grieving. And as so much in our modern lives, we keep it private. We put on our game face and carry on. Very simply, lament is an outward expression of an inner grief, an inner grief. It's a way of making our pain known. And as an outward expression, it reminds us that grief is not private. It is communal. Lament speaks to our experience that all is not right with this earth and all is not right with us. Theologian and author Cole Arthur Riley writes that every ache is an admission that something matters. Lament is a way of talking to God and each other about our brokenness, about our grief. It's a way of interweaving our stories, making your grief our grief. It's how hope's salve knows where to go, writes Riley. Lament is an opportunity for us to reweave the frayed threads of our connections, our interdependencies on each other and on the earth. The thought that has been nagging at me lately is what is the relationship between the way we care for ourselves and the way we care for the earth? Pastor Andy Lloyd, as a former biology professor, wrote an article for the September 2022 Christian Century entitled, The Land Moans. She lifts a text from the prophet Hosea, chapter four, verses one through three, and it reads, Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel, for the Lord has an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land swearing, lying, and murder, and stealing, and adultery break out. Therefore, the land mourns, and all who live in it languish, together with the wild animals and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea are perishing. The land mourns. The land mourns. 
What Hosea knows is that when one thing gets out of whack, everything gets out of whack. And a more familiar way that we have heard this comes from the aerospace industry, Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong, will go wrong. wrong. Or from the management studies, Drucker's Law is that if one thing goes wrong, everything else will and at the same time. While Drucker and Murphy don't come from a biblical wisdom perspective, they have some sense about Hosea's wisdom. Everything is connected. Hosea is not offering a simplistic critique. We might think that the land is mourning all those pipelines across sacred native lands, mourning strip mining, mourning deforestation, mourning the mounds of plastic everywhere, mourning fill in the blank of your greatest ecological sorrow. But the land, she is not mourning simply for the land's sake. The land mourns because there is a brokenness in the people. There is no faithfulness, no loyalty, no knowledge of God. There's swearing and lying and murder and stealing and adultery and all of these crimes, all of these crimes have victims. All of these crimes are pointing to the torn fabric of our relationships. Hosea points to all creation as being in relationship. The created world and humanity, they depend, we depend on one another. Concurring, Pastor Lloyd writes, now as then, all of creation is torn by manifold injustices, wrought and perpetuated by the exploitative systems in which we live, torn by ideologies of scarcity that teach us to love too narrowly and too little. To mourn is to speak the truth to the lies that prop up the denial on which the status quo depends. Together we speak the truth to lies. All is not right with our world and all is not right with us. And there's sorrow, there is so much sorrow. And perhaps we don't lament and speak the truth to lies. It's not because we're lazy or crummy Christians, but rather I wonder if we fear that if we lament and speak aloud our true reality, because the depth of our sorrow, it would engulf us, it would overwhelm us. We fear we might lose ourselves, lose sight of the fact that we are more than our pain and we are more than our suffering and sorrow. The depth of our immense sorrow, our inability to fathom a way out and couple that with the enormity of creation's devastation at the hands of these exploitative systems and ideologies of scarcities can be paralyzing. Maybe it is paralyzing. And that's a problem if, and only if, we stand alone. What is our way out of this conundrum? Or is there a way out of this debilitating situation? Is there any path forward, what might help us travel on a road that leads to commitment to an interdependency, a mutual flourishing as agents of justice? The New Testament text this morning can help us. First John's message about salvation has two core beliefs, that God is light and that God is love. And if God is life, then fellowship with God requires that the community to live as Jesus lived. And if God is love, then God's children must love one another, must love each other as Jesus loved, self-sacrificially and with action and truth. And verse 14 says, we know that we have transferred from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. We love who and what God loves. When something or someone like our earth is in need and we care, then we must act. 
We don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. We obey God's commandments and, and then we abide in God. We put our money where our mouth is. And let me tell you, that can hurt. Anybody heard of If You Care Earth Friendly Products? They sell recycled aluminum foil for $7.99 plus shipping for a grand total of $12.99 for 50 square feet. You can get the same, no, you can get Kroger's and Mariano's for $5.49. It's kind of a big ouch, a big difference. And I'm not suggesting that we all go out and buy, if you care, aluminum foil products. However, I am saying that to walk the walk requires commitment and action and truth and often inconvenience. And it requires community. We will not all respond to the tragedies of our earth or the tragedies of our communities in the same way, but we will respond. We will not let despair or the enormity of the problem paralyze us. We are members of one body and do not operate alone. God has named us. God has named us representatives on earth. We are God's agents and we are Holy Spirit empowered. And it is in our community that we support and challenge and care for the choices that each of us makes. We have choices. We support different causes. We support different people. And that's okay. Because there is more than enough. There are more than enough communities and persons and earth responses that need our help, our care, our commitment, and our love. And that's just another opportunity for us to educate one another about the realities of this world. And as members of one body, we are always acting in concerted cosmic action. Your contributions and your support, it supports mine. And my contributions support yours. We are co-conspirators. That means we breathe together. We breathe together as we do our part to heal the world. You may choose to get one of those reacher things and keep your block clean, or you may choose to plant milkweed seeds for the butterflies to feed on, or you may choose to make a co compost pile or keep bees, or you may give up your very elite and very expensive sneaker collection, or maybe you cook more instead of ordering delivery, or maybe you work in the community garden, or you go to Garfield Conservative, or the Botanical Gardens, or Morton Arboretum. Whatever you do, no matter how small you think it is, no matter how you think, how can this possibly matter? Remain obedient and walk the walk. Or in the words of theologian Arthur Cole Riley, delight in our doing without being reduced to our output. We serve a God who multiplied a measly number of loaves and fishes to serve a multitude. And surely this God will honor our obedient efforts in the same fashion, even if we don't see it. My sisters and my brothers, stand firm in the promise that if we keep God's commandments, if we love in action and truth, then we remain in God and God remains in us. The old people you see used to say, God abides. God abides in you. We abide in God. We are mediators of God's presence in the world, messengers and agents and ambassadors. And what an honor that is and what a commitment to let our whole lives, to let every decision we make reflect the life of Jesus. By God's spirit within us, we cannot love too narrowly or too little. We have God's spirit within us, and that means we have the power to change the world. And this is the world that we are utterly dependent upon for our life. Let's get to work.